Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here. I presume you know why you're here and, uh, uh, and who our distinguished speaker is, so I will not go through the long bio, but uh, suffice to say that uh, Professor Steven Pinker, who is the Johnston Professor of Psychology at Harvard, is a leading authority in uh, psychology, experimental psychology, visual cognition, psycholinguistics, and social relations. And there are at least three strands of work that uh, I know him of, of him for. Uh, the third is a book, The Sense of Style, and uh, that's the one that I own and I use on a, on a fairly regular basis. Um, perhaps more, uh, more famous are the two other strands of work. One is uh, the book, How the Mind Works. So this is the use of language and linguistics as a gateway into how the mind works. And the other more recent publication, which is Enlightenment, Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress. So I thought we'll, we'll talk about the second two themes, uh, and I'm sure there's a connection between uh, the two, so we'll pursue uh, both of those. We'll try and talk for about... Uh, half an hour or so, and then we'll open it up to Q&A so that you can also participate in this discussion. Uh, Professor Pinker, welcome. Thank you for being here. We know you flew over just uh, earlier today, so thank you very much for, uh, for giving us time. Um, my first question, uh, Professor Pinker, should we, should we respect our elders? <laughs> Uh, well, we should respect them as, as individuals. But not we because should, of their age. Not because of their age per se. Recognizing that when you live more years, there are more experiences that you can learn from. Uh, that there's a prima facie case that an older person who has lived through um, more of life mm -hmm. has uh, something to, uh, to, to teach us. But also recognizing that uh, by their very nature, uh, times change, and so that someone who comes of age in an earlier uh, period may not be savvy about the new world that has, uh, uh, has arrived in the interim. Okay. So a skeptical respect. I, My, I have two sons, they're both very young. I, I overheard the older one say to the younger one, uh, we need to listen to dad because he has seen more future. Mm. Um, <laughs> I, I, I that's that's good, if, that's good. I, I don't know if there is any enlightenment basis to that, but we'll come back to that in, in, in a moment. Um, I have some uh, preconceived biases about your thesis on the enlightenment book. But before I, I go into that, perhaps if you could give us a, uh, a summary from your perspective as to what the key message or messages are from that, uh, from that book. Yes, the, the subtitle of the book is The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress. I use the word enlightenment as a, uh, a summary or a rubric for those ideals. Uh, and it is uh, <coughs> a, uh, I, I promote the, the enlightenment package, the enlightenment project. It could also be called secular humanism. It could also be called liberal cosmopolitanism as an alternative to other systems that, that, uh, that are from time to time popular, such as nationalism, such as uh, religious uh, authority. The idea simply being that if we apply reason to understand the world, uh, that is reason and science, if we set as our goal human flourishing, life, health, happiness, knowledge, uh, leisure, opportunities to enjoy the social, cultural, and natural world, uh, then we can gradually succeed. That uh, we are, uh, that the universe doesn't have any uh, interest in our well-being. If we want to improve our well-being, we have to figure out how to do it ourselves. That we have the power of knowledge which we can amplify by certain norms and institutions, such as free speech and education, open debate, uh, uh, empirical testing. And that uh, not only can we, in theory, improve human well-being by applying knowledge and, uh, and um, sympathy, but that in reality we have, not everywhere perfectly, 
but that human progress is a factual reality. Which is to say that if you measure aspects of human well-being over time, such as poverty, such as illiteracy, such as war, crime, violence against women, uh, then uh, almost every measure of human well-being has shown improvement. Uh, sometimes over centuries, sometimes uh, over decades. So it suggests that the key idea of the Enlightenment, uh, that we can use knowledge to improve human well-being, works. Well, I'm not sure the, the last point you made, which is a direct link between all of the progress that you said we've made and we've seen, which I agree with, and the link directly to Enlightenment. So we'll flesh that out a, a little bit. But the other... Uh, question I guess I have is how do you know? Uh, what's the, uh, there's some st statistics, there's some empirical basis I imagine behind the assertion that we are, that things are good. Well things are better, uh, that, okay. which is not the same as saying that things are good, right. but uh, uh, as bad as it is now, it used to be worse. And th these are based on, uh, on data sets uh, assembled by scholars and workers in, in uh, NGOs and historians and uh, data scientists uh, the, to measure uh, aspects of well-being such as poverty, such as war deaths, how many people every year get killed in wars, such as crime, uh, such as um, uh, literacy and illiteracy. There are people who devote their, their careers to trying to quantify these. Right. I rely on uh, their data sets, which I have plotted as 75 graphs in Enlightenment now, and that is the basis for the case that progress has taken place. So I live in London, which is considered to be a relatively prosperous part of the world at, at a global level. In my neighborhood, homelessness has gone up by 4% every year for the last five years. Knife crime has gone up some 30% for two years over the last two years. Um, my felt experience is very different to these global aggregate numbers that you're putting up. Um, how do I make that connection? Well, you have to uh, first just uh, appreciate that an average does not ap apply to every last individual. So yes, if you choose the worst things that have happened in the last few years, they are the worst things that have happened but they are not, don't represent the way the world as a whole is going, even the, the way the country is going, even the way your neighborhood may have been going over a longer period of time than just the last four years. But who There's should a, care then? It, so the aggregates, this is to me the tyranny of the average, or the tyranny of the aggregates. It doesn't apply to me, it doesn't apply to any individual. Why should we care about these numbers? It does apply to individuals. It applies to more individuals than not. That's what an average means. So yes, it does apply to individuals. Uh, but if you are, uh, unless you are doing a narrative of every biography of all 7.5 billion people, which no one can work with, which doesn't t tell you anything about how to improve uh, the lots of individual humans, you have to look at uh, averages, not just averages, you also have to look at the range and the, the variance. Uh, you have to look at trends that go down as well as trends that go up. Right. And it would be a mistake to think that progress means that everything gets better for everyone everywhere all the time. And to say, well, I can find a neighborhood where things have gone worse, therefore there's no progress. That is not a sensible way to ask the question of what, answer the question of whether progress has taken place. Of course, if you pick the, the worst areas, if you look for the trends have gone, that have gone downward, you'll find them because progress is not magic. Take How, homelessness, by the way, has gone down in the United States uh, uh, over, over the last okay. uh, 30 years. That's, that's a prosperous country. What's well, and so to, is Britain. What's happened to life expectancy in life? the US? Well, life expectancy in the U.S. in the last um, two or three years has kind of flattened out even a small decline mm -hmm. because of the, mainly because of the opioid epidemic. But once again, that's the wrong way to answer the question, has there been progress? Right. Because you're assuming that if there's progress, everything has to go up everywhere always. Okay. The uh, truth is, life expectancy has increased massively across the world in the United States, not 100% of years, not 100% of places. So it's a mistake to say, well, I can find one place where it seems to have leveled off recently and use that as a counterexample to progress. Okay, inequality. 
Is that a problem? I think that inequality per se is not a problem. I think that poverty is a problem. I think that wage stagnation is a problem. I think that the uh, influence of money on politics is a problem. I don't think the gap between the, the rich and the poor itself is a problem. I think Irrespective they, of the scale, so if you look at the US, for example, top 1% income versus top 50%, apparently it used to be 40 times in the early 1980s, it's now 140 times. In Europe, it's 30 times uh, today. So is there a scale at which point we say inequality is a problem, or is it not a problem as long as the bottom 50% are marginally better off than what they were in the early 80s? Well, they should be more than marginally better off. Okay. But, but yes, the, the, uh, the relevant question is how well off are most people, right. not how big is the gap between the, the uh, best off and the, the uh, not as well off. Because if the, if the goal was simply to reduce the gap, then you could simply burn down the, the uh, houses of rich people. Uh, you could confiscate their wealth and fritter it away, fritter it away on, uh, on weapons. Uh, you could reduce the uh, inequality that way, but that would not be human progress. And in fact, we know from history that often when inequality is reduced, it's because of epidemics, it's because of violent revolutions, it's because of major wars. Uh, that's a good way to reduce inequality. None of those are forms of human progress. Okay, so let's look at where is it that we have seen progress, particularly economic progress and progress in social indicators infant mortality, um, uh, life expectancy, and so on. It's really been China and Asia. No, it's been everywhere. I, the, it's been very dramatic in China and Asia, but, um, uh, but there has been economic growth all over the world. I mean, in the vast majority of countries. What's the, and what's the enlightenment case for China and Asia? How did they... I see the progress. I don't see the enlightenment in the definition that I'm used to. Well, one of the um, gifts of the enlightenment was the idea of markets and uh, trade, both as a way of generating wealth, uh, as opposed to the pre-modern systems of royal charters and monopolies and uh, um, uh, uh, high tariffs. The idea National that- National champions, state-owned enterprises, huge government role, role of the government in these enterprises. That is the China model. That's the East Asian model. Well, it is, um, and, and that itself was not an Enlightenment idea. But on the other hand, global trade uh, certainly is, and, uh, and market forces within the country. And of course, the ultimate government uh, state enterprises took place in China under Mao, in which case it was horribly impoverished. Uh, and, and the great growth starting with Deng uh, uh, including included a liberalization of markets, which brought about not just uh, the increase in affluence, but another Enlightenment uh, ideal that we do see taking place in Asia is the uh, idea sometimes called um, du commerce, gentle commerce, the idea that trading states have less of an, of an incentive to wage war. And in fact, uh, for all of the talk of the military buildup in China, uh, <coughs> China has actually been a for the last uh, 35 to 40 years, a particularly peaceful part of the world, after many decades and centuries of being one of the most violent <coughs> parts of the world, uh, there have been uh, very few wars in, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, a, a huge contrast to, of course, Vietnam and Korea uh, and, uh, and other wars prior to that time. See, first with the, the, this simultaneous with the development of uh, uh, trading states. So this is why I would suggest that perhaps we are a little bit, maybe a few years too late for such broad brush narratives, because this resonates with uh, Tom Friedman's The World is Flat, and he talks about two countries that have McDonald's in them do not go to war. Um, yes, the Golden even, Archer's Theory. The Golden Archer's yes. Theory, even earlier than that, you had Francis Fukuyama's End of History, and now we have Enlightenment, and if I could be a bit provocative, the, the fundamentalism of enlightenment, uh, which to me suggests that you know, that is the answer. And mm. that is the broad, broad strokes answer to 
to everything, everywhere. Not fundamentalism. Am I, mis am I misreading it? Yes. Okay. Yes. There's no fundamentalism. The right. whole point of enlightenment is that it is a, a process of asking questions and uh, letting the world answer them. That is, looking to see what works and what doesn't work. Yes. I mean, you, you use the word fundamentalism. Uh, that word is nowhere in the book. It has n it's the opposite of, of enlightenment thinking. Great. I think it couldn't be more. To... It couldn't be more opposite. That's the, the enlightenment is the opposite of fundamentalism. It is the use of reason as a fundamentalism means going back to some text, taking that text as a, a, as a um, infallible guideline. That was what the what the enlightenment thinkers revolted against. So, are we in the age of enlightenment now, or are you saying we need to go back to an age of enlightenment? Neither. Uh, okay. Certainly not to go back. Uh, again, that would be the opposite of the uh, Enlightenment ideals. And I should, again, I'll make it clear that the, in, in titling the book Enlightenment Now, the idea wasn't to say those guys in the 18th century, they were great prophets and seers and sages and we should go back to their wisdom and parse their texts. That's the exact opposite of the message. Right. I needed a, 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 a name for reason, science, humanism, and progress. The Enlightenment Project, Enlightenment Ideals, are uh, a, a well-known rubric for that set of ideas. Uh, and indeed, many of the 18th century thinkers do deserve credit for coming up with some of them, but it is absolutely not that we should treat them as secular prophets. But is, as is for the, now, so-so. Yeah. Uh, Depends on the organization, depends on the country. I think we do have a, uh, we are seeing enlightenment ideals play out in some aspects of the current scene. The uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights in countries that are uh, democracies, in attempts to uh, reduce uh, and eventually eliminate war, which we have to realize, even though that seems obvious, that seems almost uh, 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 banal or trite, but it wasn't so long ago that war was considered to be inherently worthy. And uh, artists and philosophers would say if a country ever sank into peace, it would lose its artistic creativity and its vitality, it would become selfish and consumerist and cowardly and effeminate, and that war was a good thing, not a bad thing. The mere fact that now you don't hear that kind of language, that uh, however hypocritical, countries say that they are dedicated to peace, that itself is a change and an example of how, of w at least one enlightenment idea that, uh, that has gone, gone viral, as we say. But is there a role for religion? Spirituality, meditation, Deepak Chopra, Ariana Huffington. I, I, uh, I'd say not. <laughs> forget Deepak. Uh, hey. Meditation, quite possibly. Uh, the, uh, I mean, w why not? Uh, religion. I would just differentiate religious institutions, which can have a constructive role in, especially in parts of the world where other institutions are are weak that uh, because religion got a head start, it's got uh, these, these uh, legacy schools and hospitals and community centers. Uh, even in, in rich countries, uh, religious institutions can be a site for, uh, for ceremony, for beauty, for community. Uh, it's just the, the, the uh, religious morality and the theistic morality, the idea that you get your goals, your sense of right and wrong from scripture, from priests, from uh, imams, uh, that would definitely go against uh, enlightenment thinking since it would be uh, not the same as basing your morality on human well-being. How about wisdom passed down from my grandmother, for example? Not scientifically tested, but you could call it superstition. I think it works. What's your view on that? I think you have to evaluate it. That is, How it, I would wouldn't... you do that with scientific methods? Yes, with, scientific, with, uh, so, with reason and scientific methods. Because a lot of the wisdom from our elders is superstition. A lot of it is oppression. The idea, I mean, wisdom from the elders could be that uh, a, a woman has to be subservient to her husband. 
uh, that, it, that a husband has or, a right to dominate his, his wife. Or we touch the feet of our, of our parents before we leave home in the morning. Is that, how do I prove that that has any effect on, on well-being, but it is done by probably a billion people around the world? Well, if it has, if it, if it has the, the benefit of bringing families together, of increasing uh, warmth and solidarity, uh, that is, if there is, a, if there is a good reason behind it, if people benefit and if, it, if they aren't harmed, then, then it would be, of course, a good thing. Okay. Uh, but just because people do it doesn't mean that it's a good thing because there are an awful lot of things that people do that uh, because of tradition, uh, because of uh, patriarchal authority that we now realize are, are, are not so good. Uh, female genital cutting, uh, arranged uh, marriages of children, uh, the uh, uh, criminalization, sometimes execution of homosexuals. Uh, you could have a long list of uh, slavery. There are lots of things that our ancestors thought were, were just fine and that, uh, that, that we've thought twice of. In general, the criterion would be, can you justify it? Is it does it lead to advances in, in uh, human life, health, happiness, or does it uh, work against them? Those that, that advance human well-being, well, let's keep those. Well, just to one last point on this. When you say justify it, if I need to justify it with a time series of data and show that there is a T statistic of a certain strength, in order for me to then follow that, we will be incapacitated. Incapa There's just yes. no way we, no. Can, we can take decisions based on that kind of scientific rigor. No, that is true. That is certainly true. Yes, yeah, so it, and, and short of that, we have to work with the evidence that we have. Uh, uh, based on, on the, the best evidence that we do have available to us, not always statistical, but is there evidence that this leads to suffering or, uh, or uh, flourishing? Okay. Thank you. So I'll move on now to the linguistic side of things and hopefully we'll bring it together with uh, a little bit on, on the phenomenon of populism that we see right now. Um, the, just to, to educate us a little bit on how you conduct your uh, neuro-linguistic studies, is, is that based on lab data or what is the scientific approach? Well, I'm, I'm pretty eclectic in my, uh, in, in my approach, as is the overall field uh, sometimes called cognitive science, which is the study of the mind using methods from experimental psychology, from theoretical linguistics, from artificial intelligence, uh, ideas from uh, philosophy of mind and philosophy of language, and from uh, neuroscience. So over the course of my career, I have, for example, analyzed uh, online data sets of uh, children in conversation with their parents over a period of several years to trace their language development from the age of around two when first kids first start putting words together, sampled an hour a week for several years to trace out the development of words, of grammar, of sentences. So that's one technique. I've brought people into the lab and flashed words on a screen and they have to respond as quickly as possible to read them or to convert them to say the plural or the past tense to see to, and then to clock how long it takes people to execute a basic operation of language. Right. In collaborations I've, uh, I've done done uh, one study uh, using uh, functional neuroimaging where people are slid into a big electromagnet and uh, we look at the flow of blood to different parts of the brain as right. they um, uh, think, that, as they understand a sentence or, um, or uh, try to speak it. We've looked at uh, some, uh, neurological patients who have had uh, damage to the brain where a stroke has left one part or another. Uh, 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 injured to see right. what parts of language are impaired. Then I looked at the language itself. I've looked at how words change over the history of the English language and also simply the, the logic of, of, of language itself. What are the past tenses I of see. regular verbs, irregular verbs? So I look at a, a very a eclectic, try to converge with many methods. Right. Do, would you say that um, uh, our, our language 
how we speak, what we speak has a bearing on how we think? Is there a direct link between the two? It has a bearing in that uh, having a word for something certainly makes it easy to remember. It makes it uh, easier often to manipulate it and combine it with other ideas. But I don't think that we speak in our native language. I mean, sorry, I don't think we think in our native language. I see. Uh, language is too slow. It's too um, coarse. Our thoughts, we probably have a uh, hundred different thoughts for every word that we know. Uh, there, uh, we know that creatures who don't have language certainly can think, such as babies, such as uh, many non-human animals. Mm. And the language itself is, uh, we constantly change. We invent new words, new acronyms, we borrow from other languages, we invent new jargon. Right. There's a belief, a superstition, if, uh, that you'd probably call it, that uh, among some that the advent of new technology, chat rooms and uh, text messages, it is changing the way young people are communicating and therefore is it dumbing things down? Is it, a, is it impairing their ability to think? I mean, you know, let's do a quick test. LOL, OMG, IDK, TBH. What's IRL? Uh, I'm, I'm probably too old to, to know what IRL is. Uh, in real life. In I real learned life. it today. I didn't Excellent. know that. I learned yes. it today. And LOL does not, I mean, as so, one writer uh, who was not savvy enough, uh, he, got a, he thought that LOL meant lots of love. And so uh, someone wrote to him. Yes, uh, he is the Prime Minister of UK, actually. He oh, says, <laughs> the uh, the uh, guy who called the referendum. Um, <laughs> so. Former Prime Minister. Uh, former Prime Minister. Prime Minister, Minister now is a she, remember. That's yes. right. So what's your view? Does it dumb things down or are we, uh, is no, it really we, a superstition? We, we have to, um, well, a couple of things. One is that we, none of us has a single form of language that we use in all contexts and all media. We speak differently if we're addressing a crowd, if we're speaking to our uh, spouse, if we are jotting down a note. Uh, and uh, the abbreviations that are used, say, in instant messaging, some of which have themselves become obsolete because they originated in the uh, area of dumb phones where you had to press a, key, a number key three times to get a letter. Right. And that's, that was the heyday of these abbreviations. Yeah. Now that you have full keyboards, there's even less use of, the, of those uh, abbreviations. But remember that, it, uh, but so that the form of language that you use in texting is one of many forms of language that we use. And there's no reason to think that that particular form will bleed over into the way that people converse, the way they write, uh, and so on. It's similar to fears in every generation that whatever the new technology is, it marks the death of the language. It was said of television, of radio, of telegraphy. We've got to remember that in the age of telegraphy, when people paid by the word, they would omit the words that were obvious from context, the prepositions, the articles. It did not change the English language because when people weren't uh, composing telegraphs, they still use the, the articles and prepositions. Well, I guess it wasn't as widespread as Twitter is right now. No, it isn't, but we aren't seeing the, the uh, we, we are not, because the form of language that you use on Twitter, again, is one form of language that you use. Uh, it isn't Kofefe the form. is a word we learned. Uh, yeah, we did, the, yes. Yeah. <laughs> if that's the, assuming that's the pronunciation, that yeah. was a uh, uh, a enigmatic, mysterious, uh, presumably typo from uh, President Donald Trump. Kofefe, right. uh, um, but no, uh, to this day, no one knows what he meant. <laughs> Quick extension to the same line of thinking about you know technology, fearing technology. Um, does it matter if children? Uh, today go straight to the keyboard and do not learn how to use a pen. Does that have an impact on their learning? Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a good question and it certainly, uh, so uh, you know, I was brought up in an era to, to write with a fountain pen and to write cursively, which at least in the United States, fewer and fewer children are being taught to do. They still are taught to use a pen, but they, uh, they, they print each letter separately. Right. The, uh, but that uh, flowing cursive script of one uh, letter tied to the, the other. I, I have read that it is starting to die out and probably we won't miss it because it was often quite illegible. Uh, and um, uh, if rapid printing uh, is still being taught, which, which it is and which would be necessary simply because 
pen and paper are really good for some contexts, mm -hmm. then, uh, then I don't think we, we would necessarily miss cursive writing. I see. OK. Um, one more question before we open it up to the audience. So please uh, get ready with your questions. Uh, the role of language in fueling or diffusing extremism, populism, uh, particularly if you could speak to this notion of the dog whistle, mm. which is used by mainstream politicians, uh, but in order to mobilize forces that are not apparent at the first brush. Would you agree that these are instances of language being weaponized, or are we putting too much weight on these things? Is it political correctness gone or I? if we harp on in that direction too much. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, the dog whistle, which is, uh, alludes to the metaphor of a sound that is inaudible to uh, humans but audible to dogs, uh, in the political context refers to rhetoric or messages or keywords that uh, sound innocuous to uh, people who don't know that it's actually a signal for some theme that means a lot to them, but that most other people won't notice. So there are dog whistles to fundamentalist Christians, to uh, um, uh, right-wing nationalists, um, and probably to other groups as well. I think the phenomenon of dog whistles is not to be not to blame for the for the rise of populism, because it's just an extension of how we uh, always speak. Uh, in conversation, we use a lot of euphemism and innuendo. We say, uh, if you could pass the salt, that would be uh, awesome, uh, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but we all know what it means. It's being polite, and it's, it's a way of avoiding uh, giving someone an order as if they are your servant. We say things like, um, would you like to come up and see my etchings, uh, instead of would you like to have sex? Uh, the, we. Uh, uh, in raising money, we say things like, we're counting on you to show leadership in our uh, campaign for the future rather than uh, give money. Uh, so the phenomenon of not saying exactly what we mean but shilly-shallying, beating around the bush, is just what we need to make our, our, lubricate our social relationships uh, while, while uh, conveying messages and not saying everything to everyone. So I do think that we have to be concerned about the rise of intolerant, illiberal movements such as populism. But I, I suspect that all politicians use some kinds of dog whistle just because, especially in a democracy, there are multiple factions, there are multiple coalitions. For a politician to get into power, uh, he or she must assemble a coalition. And since almost anything you say will offend someone, there is an art to uh, language that is not too specific. So we criticize our politicians for not speaking honestly. At the same time, whenever they do speak honestly, they get crucified. There is a, 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 a famous wisecrack made by the American writer Michael Kinsley of uh, what is the definition of a gaffe in Washington? And it is a gaffe is when a politician says something that's true. <laughs> Um, the New Zealand Prime Minister chose not to name the terrorist. Yes. Is that a good thing, bad thing, doesn't matter? I think it is a good thing. And I have actually um, lent my, been a signatory on a, 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 a call for newspapers to not uh, name or show the photos of rampage shooters. The rationale being that the only motive for a rampage shooter is publicity. There's nothing in it for them uh, other than, than notoriety. Sometimes it's enough that it be posthumous notoriety for some pathetic nobody who, for whom fame is more important than anything, including life himself. A guaranteed way to become famous, the only guaranteed way to become famous, is kill a lot of innocent people. Now, we're, that, that, there is a, a cycle there where journalism uh, creates that incentive, it feeds into it by giving saturation coverage to uh, mass murder uh, of innocents. Even if, by the criterion of how much danger is there really, how much harm that it does, rampage shooters are a tiny fraction of homicides. But they know that they can uh, get on the front page of every paper in the world and obsess the conversation for weeks, perhaps even become immortal, because they're so, like, 
Columbine shooters. We can talk about them uh, 25 years after the fact. They're dead, but they have become, uh, in a macabre way, immortal. So how do we break that cycle? I mean, there is the move to, for, for weapons control, and, and I certainly applaud that. In the United States, it's too late for that because there are too many weapons circulating. But to, uh, to deprive uh, that, uh, that movement of oxygen, that is just not doing something that people are informed, but it doesn't create the incentive uh, of, uh, of fame or notoriety right. by giving their name, their, uh, their, their uh, face, their manifesto. Uh, I think that is a kind of responsibility I see. that I would, I would congr uh, applaud. Thank you. So we have uh, nine minutes left <laughs> and lots of arms in the, in the air. Uh, I'm going to be very random, but this gentleman did put it up first, so please go ahead with that. We have a microphone coming. Okay. Uh, Professor Pinker. You mentioned today in your keynote uh, two um, uh, global threats, uh, those being um, the threat of a nuclear war and environmental damage. Uh, that reminded me to, uh, to another book, a great book that I recently read uh, from uh, Yuval Harari, uh, The 21st uh, Lessons for the 21st Century. He mentions three global threats, the two you mentioned plus um, AI and the uh, shock waves that AI will uh, bring to the labor markets. Um, so my name is Pablo. Would love to hear your views on, on that third uh, global threat. Yes. Got it. Well, the uh, artificial intelligence, like social media, is has sort of blamed for every problem on the planet now and every future problem. Uh, and I think there are a number of different. Uh, threats that have been put together under artificial intelligence. One is that artificial intelligence will take over and enslave us. I think that's nonsense. Another is that it will reduce us to raw materials or destroy us as collateral damage. It will pursue a goal and in the, by pursuing the goal single-mindedly it will uh, eliminate humanity. Uh, the third, uh, which is obviously much uh, less catastrophic is that it'll disrupt labor markets by putting certain, making certain occupations obsolete. For example, possibly truck drivers. What are we going to do with all of the unemployed truck drivers? I think it's too soon to tell for a number of reasons. One of them is that the pace of, uh, of job replacement by artificial intelligence is, is much slower than people anticipated because uh, intelligence is really hard uh, and we don't know even how to get uh, a system that will drive a truck from point to point without doing damage now, let alone replacing the entire work face, pl workforce. So uh, it, it won't be, I think it won't be as rapid as people think. We also don't know whether new jobs will um, materialize to replace old ones, as has happened in the past when there has been mechanization. If there is, then I think we do have to look toward modifications of the economic system we have to use the same ingenuity that allowed us to develop artificial intelligence to compensate for changes in the labor movement. Some people believe that would have to be a universal basic income. It might be more of a negative income tax that uh, uh, supplements uh, the lower incomes. It may be programs like the United States ha had during the New Deal in the 1930s where government paid people to do projects that were good for the whole country that the private market uh, would not support. Great. The next question, please. No, uh, sorry. Uh, you can go ahead. And then, can we take two questions together? Let's no, do this. No, let's do one at a time. OK. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to tax human memory by having two questions okay. in a row without answers. Hi, thank you. I'm Cherry Sassina with Global Storymakers in the United States and Kenya. Um, I have a question about your, your data with regard to war. You said that there's, it, there's been a decline, and I'm wondering how you define war, because I see this artificial intelligence um, as another type of weapon. Yeah, I think um, if you use metaphors, then anything can be a form of anything else. So when I mean war, I mean war. I mean people, sh armies shooting people. Uh, and there are precise definitions of what counts as a war uh, used by organizations such as the Uppsala Conflict Data 
Project and the Peace Research Institute of Oslo, where they do their best to keep the yardstick constant over time, and those are the data that I use. And it refers to the uh, deliberate uh, infliction of uh, violence by a, uh, at least a government on one side. Yes, physical violence, the, yes. The lady over there, and then if you could pass the mic to the gentleman in front of you when you're done. Okay. But okay. after you, will come to this side. Okay, I'll ask my question quickly, thank you. Um, I want to pull focus actually to the classroom and to education um, and to return to this idea of critical thinking. So we know that critical thinking requires nuance, it requires subtlety, um, and uh, it requires a, a sophistication uh, potentially of language. Uh, if we look at studies such as the, the Hart and Risley, the 30 million word gap um, that clearly looks at the impact, the socioeconomic impact on uh, language acquisition, in early years, um, what one simple thing, and probably there is no answer to this, can teachers do in the classroom to introduce more subtlety and nuance when we are uh, attempting to teach critical thinking in a context of cynicism, skepticism, LOL, IRL, mutuals and it. motives? I think we have to apply critical thinking to critical thinking. <laughs> so that, uh, yeah. So we, we can't we, we can't uh, we, we can't worry about everything. We can't treat everything as the decline of civilization. The fact that young people, and by the way, young people often refers to people who are young in the 1980s or 1990s. The fact that people use LOL is not a decline of critical thinking. We can't say that everything that young people do is civilization going downhill. That's what our parents said about us. That's what their parents said about them. Uh, so we've got to focus on what really. Uh, what really we want to target, such as the ability to uh, evaluate the soundness of arguments, such as the application of data to empirical propositions. Uh, so we've got to set our goals, and I think it is extremely valuable that critical thinking be part of the uh, curriculum, but we also have to uh, pay attention to what works and what doesn't work, because it's a, a sad fact that a lot of critical thinking curricula fail to th teach critical thinking, probably for reasons why many curricula fail, namely often our intuitions about how best to teach students just don't work in reality. And I'm, I confess that I would be an example as a college professor. Um, I give lectures and students take notes and they highlight a textbook. That's probably not the most effective way to convey knowledge. Uh, but we do know that there are ways of um, uh, engaging critical thinking more, having students <laughs> argue in small groups, forcing them to defend their opinions, transferring a, a, um, a lesson that they learned from one context to a very different context. So we have to constantly be attentive to what, what works and what doesn't, which may often surprise us. Okay. I'm David Coltard from Zimbabwe. Uh, in an African context, there are still some Western governments uh, who have a foreign policy based on the example of uh, Singapore and their argument is that long-term sustainable development is best uh, done by benign dictatorships. A, a good dose of authoritarian rule can achieve that. I'm very interested to hear your views in the correlation between enlightenment and long-term sustainable economic development. Yes, well, the, um, a, a lot hinges on, on benign. And the problem with autocracies is they don't off, often they don't stay benign for long, uh, simply because by being autocracies, there isn't the feedback loop that forces them to change to their policies in ones. response to their actual effects on the well-being of their uh, citizens. The advantage of a democracy is if people get mi are miserable, they can throw the government out without violence. Singapore has not done a bad job. Uh, they, they have uh, not abused the autocracy too badly. Uh, and of course, Singapore is fantastically wealthy, uh, fantastically safe. Despite being multi-ethnic, there is uh, very little ethnic violence. On the other hand, I, I looked at the data for Singapore, and people are, considering how wealthy it is, the people aren't that happy. Uh, and ultimately, happiness is what we ought to strive for. One of the components of happiness is affluence, so they've done a good job there. But another component of happiness is freedom. People are happier when they feel autonomous and free, which they don't in, in Singapore, and so their happiness takes a hit. 
the gentleman over there. Uh, I have two questions. No, uh, just one, please. And it's a very just short one. question. Okay. Very short. Uh, uh, the first question is, uh, can we really move towards real democracy with the widening gap between rich and poor? This is the one question. And the other question is, we all know, and you know more than us, that uh, few languages nowadays are not only dominating other languages, but also killing other languages every year. Do you consider it to be a human progress? Well, um, I think there are threats to democracy from money in politics, and that is a constant uh, challenge to democracy to prevent the wealthy from having undue influence. I don't think that's the same as the gap between the rich and the poor, because if you were to cut the wealth of uh, the richest people in half, they could still manipulate politicians. The, I, I think we've got to meet the challenge of money in politics by addressing the challenge of money in politics through transparency, through publicly financed elections, through uh, laws that, that limit campaign contributions, and so on. Simply making the wealthy a little bit less wealthy does not solve that problem. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the loss of, of uh, uh, languages, especially those in, uh, among indigenous people, is a, a kind of tragedy for the, the diversity of human uh, cultural life. It's probably, uh, a lot of it is, is uh, not preventable, some of it is, and we ought to prevent what we can to preserve the languages that are endangered if there is a community that is uh, willing to, to uh, keep it going. Uh, the, the fact that there are uh, languages like English that are widely spoken uh, does, rep at least as a second language, does represent a kind of progress in that the hope for Esperanto, namely that if all people could communicate then the, the world would be brought together, uh, was not borne out. No one, not that many people want to learn Esperanto, but lots of people want to learn English. Doesn't it didn't have to be English. De facto that's what it is and, and that by itself is uh, not a bad thing as long as it coexists with the languages of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, the, the, the local nations and regions and cultures. Thank you. With that, we've run out of time. Uh, two apologies. Firstly, uh, I'm sorry I couldn't get to uh, everyone who wanted to ask questions. There was no science at all behind my choosing, uh, except that I was trying to go for some gender uh, balance. So apologies for that. And my apology also to you, Professor Pinker. I, tried my best to try and rile you up. I failed miserably, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but you've been a great sport, and thank you so much. Thanks very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.